All right, good evening, everyone. Hello to folks on Zoom land. Can you just indicate that you can hear me? Councillor Neal and Osanic, excellent. So welcome to planning committee. This is our final planning committee of the term. Bittersweet, of course. We're waving to you from the chambers and hopefully you can see that. So tonight we have two business items, but before we move into that part of the agenda, we have a public meeting for 7-Eleven Dalton and I will read the notice of collection for that. And I should note that it's Tuesday, November 8th. So personal information collected as a result of the public meetings are collected under the authority of the Planning Act and will be used to assist in making a decision on this matter. Persons speaking at the meeting are requested to give their name and address for recording in the minutes. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes, which will be available to the public. Additionally, interested members of the public can email the committee clerk or the assigned planner if they wish to be notified regarding a particular application. Questions regarding this collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning um, Services, who's here, Mr. Park. And I realized, speaking of Mr. Park being here, Madam Clerk, did you want to tell us who's in attendance? Are we doing that these days? If you'd like to hand it, it's up to you. Sure, why not? No problem. So that is my bad, putting the clerk on the spot. Um, I'll tell you that we have a Councillor Hutchison and Hill here in the chamber, and Councillor Chappelle has joined us also on Zoom, so we have quorum, and I'll note that too. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Joining us from staff are James Barr, Manager of Development Approvals, Ian Clendenning, Senior Planner, Amy Didrickson, Intermediate Planner, myself, Elizabeth Fawcett, Committee Clerk, Tim Park, Director of Planning Services, Ricardo Peggy, Planner, and Ian Sullivan is our meeting host for this evening. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And so the public meeting, as I mentioned, is for 7-Eleven Dalton. And who will I look to to give comment on circulation? Ian, Mr. Clendenning. There he has appeared on my screen. Over to you. Good evening, and through the chair, I can confirm that notice was given in accordance with the Planning Act, as was detailed in the public meeting report. We have received no correspondence in favor or opposition to this file. The purpose of the public meeting is for the applicant to present their proposal to the public and planning committee and answer questions from the committee and members of the public. Staff have prepared a comprehensive report summarizing this proposal. Uh, and of course, you will note that tonight's format is the presentation of a combined public meeting and comprehensive report, which are being heard concurrently. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Clendenning. And pardon me? Yes, we'll look for Mr. Keene for the proponent to give a presentation on the proposal. Mr. Keene, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening. I'll just do a sound check to ensure I, I'm being heard okay. Loud and clear. You're good. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, thank you uh, to this planning committee for the last four years of your service. I know you've had many long nights. Um, I will not speak uh, long tonight to help you not have a long one for your final meeting. So thank you very much for your service. And tonight I'm here on behalf of the Springer group of companies who are purchasing this property from the school board. And um, <clears throat> one of their terms was to rezone the property back into an industrial uh, designation. Uh, next slide, please. So on the slide, you can see uh, a community uh, context slide, which shows that this property is within the Clyde Business Park. And it's fairly close to the interchange of Highway 401 and Sir John A. McDonald. Uh, you may know some of the businesses in the area. Um, Tim Hortons always comes to mind. It's the first, first one when you enter the city at this location. But primarily, this is a, a true business park uh, with, with business park and industrial uses and very few uh, commercial uses uh, in the park. Next slide, please. Looking at this uh, slide now, we've, we've moved into an aerial image of the site itself, uh, which is a 7.4 hectare property. It has frontage on Dalton Avenue and it backs onto the highway. 
and the property has the existing secondary school which also contains community facilities uh like there's a, a play uh, playhouse there as well as the uh the playing fields at the back of the facility next slide please uh, what's unique about this property is is the official plan designation, and and you can see on the screen mostly a, a blue color, and that is the general industrial designation within the city's official plan, and the 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 medium colored blue is the city's business park industrial designation. So so the two properties that essentially have frontage on Sir John A and the 401 are business park properties. Um, that are expecting more prestigious uh, business park uses, while the light blue color is the city's heavier general industrial designation. So the having a school in this general in, industrial designation is definitely uh, a little bit unique, and, and probably many of you know the, the history of the site uh, in that regard. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is showing you the zoning bylaw. And, and as you know, the, the zoning that is in effect in the city of Kingston is the new bylaw, bylaw 2022-62. And because this site had the school or has the school on it, it has a site-specific zoning bylaw that allows the community school and the accessory community center uses on the site. So because it has a site-specific uh, zoning on it, it actually defects back to bylaw 8499. And that existing zoning on the property is quite restrictive. It really is catered towards the school and, and its uses. So the proposal that's before the committee tonight is to bring this property properly into the 2022-62 bylaw. Uh, next slide, please. So the proposal uh, before the committee uh, is, like I said, to bring it into compliance with the new bylaw. And there's no new development proposed at this time. Uh, if you're familiar with this building, you'll know that it, it was a former industrial use before it was a school. So, so it, it should be a fairly easy retrofit uh, to bring industrial uses back in the building. Um, so what we're seeking tonight is to bring it into the M2 zone and to also bring in the uh, complementary uses at the same time. You'll note on this slide that I've highlighted a 14 meter uh, setback along the northern edge with the highway. And that's an MTO requirement. So we're just, just kind of highlighting on this slide uh, some of the changes that will will result over time as the site redevelops, uh, such as the right now the school actually has an entrance to the highway that would be abandoned uh, when any redevelopment occurs on the site. Uh, next slide, please. So the plan is to rezone the property from the not applicable or bring it out of 8499 and put it into the M2 zone. And in doing so, it would permit the full list of M2 uh, general industrial uses on the site. And what's unique to this bylaw as well is that, that complementary uses have to be brought in either through amendment or through minor variance. And so because we're before this committee tonight to bring the property into M2, we're also seeking to bring in those complementary uses that would be limited to 25% of the site. Uh, so none of those uses are proposed, but the list you can see on the screen uh, is consistent with the official plan for general industrial uh, uses. Next slide, please. This is my conclusionary slide. And I, I would bring to the committee's attention that I prepared a planning report that reviewed the official plan, the provincial policy statement, and looked at both conformity and consistency with these documents. And we, we prepared a zoning bylaw that through technical comments with staff has been amended uh, to the bylaw that's before you this evening. And the site-specific zoning that's proposed uh, will bring this site into conformity with the official plan. 
and the existing school you'll see that phase out over time uh, the school will likely be there uh, for the rest of this well will be there for the rest of this school year uh, and once their new school is built you'll see the site uh, convert back to general industrial uses so in my opinion the project represents good land use planning and i'd be pleased to answer any questions of the public or the committee thank you Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. You kept your word. It was only six minutes. Very good. So because we're in a public meeting, what we can do is look to the clerk if anyone is online to participate from the public. Because looking around the horseshoe here, we see no one from the public in this room. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, I do notice that we have five members of the public at this time um, within the Zoom room, so I'm just going to ask if anyone wishes to speak to the current application, if they could please raise their hand in Zoom so that we may call on them. I'm just, oh, there we go, we've got one hand. If there's anyone else who wishes to speak, if you could please raise your hand. And Mr. Chair, we'll go over to Paul Shaves. Perfect. I believe that's Councillor Elect Shaves. Is that is that correct, Madam Clerk? <clears throat> Excellent. So, Mr. Shaves, please five minutes and include your full name and address for the file. Uh, yes, it is Councillor Elect Paul Shaves, fourteen seventy five Sierra Avenue. Um, I like the proposal as as going forward, Mr. Keen. Uh, just one question: Is there any? Uh, plans at all to divide the lot into different smaller lots or you're planning on maintaining just the school and renovating it as is and that's the only question I have thank you thank you and we see no other hand so Mr. Keene I'll actually just invite you to respond to that right off Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity and thanks for uh, coming this evening with the questions. Uh, at the time, there's no development proposed and also uh, no plans to subdivide the lands. We certainly hope to attract some tenants uh, to the existing building and, and hopefully build out the site more thoroughly uh, in time, but no, no plans to subdivide. Thank you. Thank you, so committee members. Do you have any questions for Mr. Keene or if appropriate our staff at this point? All right, seeing none, you technically do have an, oh, Councillor Hutchison right in front of me, after you. Um, I noticed that the, the proposal asked for, um, I mean, I, I don't have any real objections to it, but it's a notice is allowing for 25% commercial. Given that um, there is the last two studies of private commercial supply in Kingston, so we had a surfeit, where's the advantage to the city of allowing this 25% commercial designation? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, thank you for that comment. Um, I, I would just point out that the it, the request is for complementary uses, and certainly there are some of those uses are uh, of a commercial uh, nature. Um, but you know, one, for example, would be a laboratory, which isn't really a commercial use. So the, the intent with bringing the complementary uses in now is actually in line with the policies of the official plan that allow that 25% that complementary, certainly more commercial in nature uses within the business parks. And that really, in, in my opinion, is to allow the business parks um, to be more self-sustainable, you know, such as if you, if you go out for lunch in this business park right now, um, your options are Tim Hortons or you're, you're driving a little further down the road um, to the other end of Dalton Avenue, for example. So by allowing some of the commercial uses at a, at a limitation of 25% of the gross floor area, it does provide for that more complete uh, park. Um, so let's say, you know, you had a physiotherapist appointment and if you had your physiotherapist was in be very close to the place where you work, you may actually be able to walk within your business park rather than 
uh, driving to the under, other end of the city. So that's the reason for uh, the permission in the official plan and, and the reason we're, we're seeking that holistic amendment this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Seeing nothing else from the councillor. All right, final call, Deputy Mayor Chappelle, Councillor Neal, Councillor Hill, no. All right. Oh, Deputy Mayor Chappelle, after you. No, I, I just uh, would like to comment. I think this is a good compliment to return this to uh, to uh, industrial type property and employable lands, uh, given that uh, the city is quickly running out of lands. And I think this would be a great opportunity for this developer to uh, attract some viable businesses to the Kingston area. So I do think it's uh, suitable. Um, both of my kids went to that school and, and uh, they were prohibited from walking to school because it wasn't an industrial park. So I think going back to uh, an industrial setting is, is a great idea. So kudos to them. I applaud this uh, proposal. All right, thank you very much. And that will conclude our public meeting on 7-Eleven Dalton, but we will revisit it in a moment um, as part of our official meeting. And we can call that to order now. It's 6-17. This is planning meeting number 24, 2022. And we'll look for an approval of the agenda. We have added here. And also we have a request from the director of planning to add one business item under other business nearer to the end of the meeting. So with that said, I'll look for a mover and a shaker in Councillor Neal's words. Councillor Hill, Councillor Hutchison, all those in favor? Alrighty, very good. Confirmation of minutes from November 3rd, a mover and seconder. Councillor Hill, Councilor, Deputy Mayor Chappelle, looking for any amendments, any questions, additions, seeing none, all those in favor? Quick point of order, if I could. Please. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm, uh, you were so efficient. We got through the, uh, those points so quickly. I didn't have a chance to say this. Yes, uh, I had considered declaring a, a, a conflict and withdrawing from the, the, uh, pre, the only debate tonight, but I didn't because although elected, I don't officially take a position uh, on the board until next week when I get sworn in. So I, at this point in time, it's my understanding, having spoken briefly to a lawyer, that I don't have a conflict. And I just want to make that clear. Per Thank you. Perfect. No, no problem. And just for clarity on my end, then you're speaking of the the file we just spoke of, Dalton. Is that correct? Because it's a school. Exactly, because it involves the school. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I'll look for any other disclosures at this point, seeing none, there are no delegations or briefings, and we're back to 7-Eleven Dalton. We heard a presentation a moment ago, so at this point, unless the clerk thinks I'm out of order here, uh, we can just move directly into committee deliberation. Right, okay, I'm glad I checked. So we will do questions from committee, and then if anyone remains on the line, um, from the members of the public who would like to explore it further, we can do that too. So committee members, would anyone like to say anything about Dalton? Okay, seeing none on Zoom land, how are we doing? There are no hands. There are no hands. So maybe we can do one call to raise your hand on Zoom if you'd like to speak to 7-Eleven Dalton. All right, seeing none, we will put that on the floor with the mover and seconder. Councillor Hill, Councillor Hutchison. Seeing no movement for question or comment, all in favor? That passes unanimously. Very good. So, business item B concerning 365 Nelson Street. All right, if the planner could speak to that, please. Thank you, um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Amy Didrickson. I'm a planner with the City of Kingston Planning Services, um, and I'll be presenting the recommendation for approval of an application for zoning 
uh, bylaw amendment at 365 Nelson Street. A public meeting was held uh, just a couple months ago on September 1st of this year. Um, and as part of this presentation, I'll summarize the updates to the plans um, since the public meeting and responses to some of the matters raised by members of the community and uh, technical reviewers as part of the process. Next slide, please. Um, so the purpose of this application is to permit the uh, adaptive reuse of the existing building at 365 Nelson uh, Street for a 24 bed emergency shelter for youth and accessory support services and office space uh, for the Kingston Youth Shelter Organization. Uh, the effect will be the application of a site specific exception to the, modify uh, the urban residential 13 zone under the citywide Kingston zoning bylaw. Um, to permit uh, special needs facility use um, and to recognize existing non-compliance um, with respect to the existing building setbacks and um, planting strip requirements. Um, and I should note, in addition to the requested zoning amendment, um, site plan approval is required to permit the development um, and an application is currently, or is undergoing the, a technical review at this time. Next slide, please. Uh, the location of the property is uh, centrally located in the urban boundary where uh, the majority of growth and development is directed uh, to achieve sustainable development goals um, in our official plan. Um, the site is connected to municipal water and sewer services um, in an existing built up area. Um, it has frontage on, our, on an arterial road uh, with bus transit service. It's connected to sidewalks and active transportation connections. Uh, it's also a short walk across the street from the Kingston Memorial Center and within walking distance of the Princess Street corridor um, where there are numerous uh, commercial uses and complementary community facilities. Uh, the site contains a one-story building that was formerly occupied by a commercial dance studio. And before this, an ambulance station operated from the building from 2012 to 2015 and an automotive repair facility from uh, about 1960 to 2012. Um, the property currently does not have um, defined landscaped or amenity areas and outdoor areas are predominantly covered in asphalt or, or gravel. Next slide, please. Um, so the application, um, the proposal submitted by IBI Group on behalf of Kingston Youth Shelter proposes um, primarily an internal conversion of the existing building um, to include an updated, um, fully accessible um, shelter facility for vulnerable youth, including 24 beds, um, as well as offices for general administration and for staff uh, that provide family mediation and housing support and employment uh, support services to youth uh, staying at the shelter. Um, and to highlight, um, since the public meeting, there have been um, some um, access and parking area enhancements to the site design um, in response to technical review and public comments. Um, the driveway access has been reduced to nine meters, which complies with the zoning bylaw. And the parking area is proposed to be framed by some raised planter boxes with um, intended for some for seasonal plants, um, which will offer some much needed landscaping design treatments um, and provide a buffer and frame the parking area. Um, provide a buffer from the residential property to the north, um, as well as limit cut through traffic from the site to the south. Um, as illustrated on the on the site plan, um, it's it's hard to see, but there's a a square to the south of the building there with a dotted um, pattern on it, which is intended um, an area the Kingston U Shelter is looking at locating a community garden. Um, they'd look to partner with other uh, community organizations that specialize in food awareness and production um, so that uh, there can be, and this will ultimately activate um, this side of the site, which is currently underutilized. Next slide, please. 
Um, so five pieces of written correspondence have been received and five members of the public provided uh, oral submissions at the public meeting. Um, there's a full summary of the correspondence in the staff report before committee and along with original submissions, um, as well as an additional piece of correspondence on the addendum tonight. Um, these are the sort of key areas of interest organized by theme. Um, these included uh, parking and traffic safety, uh, there was interest in the proposed amenity area and associated privacy considerations, um, site and building design and um, crime prevention through environmental design principles um, came up through correspondence. And um, there was interest in sort of the operation of the, the facility. Um, I should highlight that some of the correspondents uh, received raised questions and concerns that were not, that didn't pertain to land use planning matters um, and will not be addressed in the presentation. Um, comments that are based on assumptions regarding a development's intended user are not considered as part of the evaluation of a planning application, um, such as a zoning amendment application, um, because fundamentally it's contrary to the human rights code um, to deny a planning application based on assumptions regarding a development's intended user. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so members of the community um, questioned the adequacy of the number of parking spaces proposed on site um, and were concerned that there might be overflow parking onto the street. Um, so the applicant has reviewed um, their parking uh, requirements and continues to propose nine parking spaces, including two accessible spaces um, consistent with the um, site plan at the public meeting. Um, a maximum of six staff would be at the facility during the day and the remaining remaining spaces would be available for families um, visiting the facility for mediation and other support services. Um, it is, there is an expectation with the zoning amendment application that all parking required will be provided on site. Um, so on-street parking um, is not required or anticipated to be required. Um, the location is well connected to transit and sidewalks. So um, staff and clients would be able to access the site or there's connections to transit and an active transportation infrastructure. Um, concerns were also raised with respect to the safety of um, the, tra the speed of traffic um, in this location and the safety of crossing at Nelson Street and Concession Street. Um, upgrades such as additional traffic lights and pedestrian crossing upgrades are outside of the scope of this um, application, um, but the City of Kingston Transportation Services um, has relayed um, that as part of their comprehensive planning process that there are some improvements planned in the vicinity, um, just one block over potentially at, at Kings Court and Concession Street or Fergus and Concession Street, um, which will provide a controlled uh, pedestrian crossing um, to transit stops in the Memorial Center in the future. Um, there was a recent report to council on this. Next slide, please. Um, several questions were raised at the public meeting about the amenity space proposed on the south side of the building as one of the sort of exterior changes to the site. Um, the applicant is proposing an at-grade patio be provided that would be approximately 150 square meters. Um, and this would be uh, fenced to allow privacy for the occupants of the building using the space and, and also in turn for surrounding land uses. Um, and details of that fencing will be um, refined through the site plan control detailed design process. Next slide, please. Um, several questions and comments were raised at the public meeting and through technical review uh, regarding the building and site design, expressing a desire to see improvements to make the building and site safer and more welcoming for residents. Um, there were comments at the public meeting expressing a desire to see the exterior of the building improved to establish a more welcoming presence for youth that's staying there. Um, there are also questions around exterior lighting and maintaining sight lines for safety. 
and when examining ways to um, improve design to maximize safety of any site undergoing development, staff and planning services refer to SEPDED principles or crime prevention through environmental design. Um, and these uh, principles sort of fundamentally, there's um, principles to maintain uh, sight lines from the public realm and increase visibility through windows where possible and avoid areas that are hidden from view. Um, so through the, the submission um, following the public meeting, the applicant has included some additional windows um, on the facade um, in the location of the existing garage door. There's some windows proposed, they're shown on this slide, um, that will increase some visibility to the parking area. Um, there's also some windows proposed, um, two additional windows facing out onto the amenity area. Um, and in terms of exterior enhancements, the, the applicant has expressed a desire to, to make um, improvements when feasible in collaboration with youth staying at the shelter. Um, they're understandably focusing on the internal design um, conversion at this point. Um, with respect to lighting, the application materials um, indicate that downward facing lighting will be provided at building entrances and adjacent to the parking lot uh, to enhance safety and details with respect to lighting um, will be reviewed further through site plan control as well. Next slide, please. Um, questions arose um, regarding the operation of the facility, um, such as plans in place during periods of increased demand. Um, residents were um, concerned around whether there'd be lineups outside uh, or encampments. Um, according to information relayed from Kingston Youth Shelter, they do not accept clients through lineup outside. They have a well-established intake process where clients book an intake appointment to come into the building and complete paperwork and where shelter staff can meet with them. Um, it's understood that um, in terms of demand, Kingston Youth Shelter has had 16 youth since March and are not full. Um, through the pandemic, they had 18 beds and were full. Um, this proposed facility would have um, 24 beds um, and it's intended to meet their projected demand. Um, also as detailed in the application materials, there's no drop-in component of the shelter to access social supports. Um, staff provide services to youth um, not, not staying at the shelter at locations off-site, um, such as the Kingston Youth Hub, and youth staying at the shelter make appointments to access um, support such as family mediation. So the level of activity and traffic in and out of the building is, is known and planned for by staff of the organization. Next slide, please. Um, so in conclusion, or as described in much greater detail in the, in the staff report before committee, um, the recommendation is for approval. Um, the zoning amendment facilitates the use of an existing building and underutilized property centrally located in the urban boundary on full municipal services, which represents an efficient form of sustainable development. The facility is located in proximity to complementary community facilities and will support the projected needs of the local homelessness services system. And through the plans and submitted technical reports, the application has demonstrated that the proposed development will be compatible with surrounding land use uses, will meet the functional needs of users, and will result in ultimately enhancements to the site. Um, the zoning amendments consistent with the provincial policy statement conforms to the official plan and constitutes good land use planning. Um, next slide, please. Um, if this zoning amendment is approved, the next steps would be the continued processing of the site plan control application, which addresses detailed design matters. Um, and a building permit will also be required um, for the internal conversion of the building, um, which would be able to be issued after the approval of site plan control. Um, and next slide. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, staff from housing are also in attendance, I believe, um, as well as the applicant, um, Tess Gilchrist from IBI Group and uh, Ann Brown from the Kingston Youth Shelter. Thank Perfect. you. Excellent, thank you very much, Ms. Didrickson. All right, because we are in the agenda section, we will go to committee first, and I already see hands coming up. So, Councillor Neal, you can take it away. 
Thank, thank you very much. Um, this is my, uh, I have no, I think the planning and the design and the applications for, for this project are great and I will be supporting the project. I just wanted to make note, and I'm glad to hear that housing is represented here tonight as well as, as planning. Um, and I, I've made this point before, but because this is my last meeting, I won't have a chance to make it again. So uh, just like years ago, all of our subsidized housing was located in the North End. And clearly that was a mistake. Uh, today, we spread out mixed affordable housing. Uh, for now, it seems to me that most of the shelters, if not all, uh, are, are concentrated in the core of the city. And I have no objection to shelters being in Kings Court, where I live, or Williamsville, where I lived and represented for years. My concern is that uh, as we continue to approve more and more shelters in the core of the city, it's going to become unfortunate in the future because we aren't, just as we should spread the wealth, we should also spread uh, the, the housing when it comes to affordable housing or shelters. So I would just be thankful, since this is my final kick at this can, if, uh, if planning and housing can make note of the fact that we really should be spreading the locations around. Uh, so far, there have been comments made from Kings Court and Williamsville, not complaining about the existing shelters and not even suggesting that we should never have shelters, but pointing out that we seem to have the majority, vast majority of, of, of uh, shelters. And uh, I look forward to hearing Councillor Hutchison's comments because he's the other, his district, I think may be affected similarly to Kings Court and Williamsville. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And if staff would like to respond, you're able to do so. If not, that's okay too. It was more of a comment to be fair, so don't need to put you on this one. Oh, Mr. Henderson, all right. <laughs> Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, those are good comments, and that's certainly something we, we talk about um, all the time when we're, we're looking at projects. Uh, we learned a little bit when the youth shelter was located in the West End at the Ridley Drive site. Um, there was some difficulties with accessing services. So, um, for example, the one roof facility that's at, um, uh, at Albert and Princess provides services to, to vulnerable youth. So there's a bit of synergy there by being in the same location or relatively similar location. And when um, the other thing that we think about too is when an individual has difficulties at one facility, uh, they can transfer to another facility where they might be able to, to um, work there. And that happens between you know the hub, um, in from the cold, um, warm center. So yeah, there's definitely, it's, it, there's, two, there's two sides to it for sure. But thank you, I'll take that uh, comment back to the team for sure. All right, thank you. Councillor Neal, you still have two and a half minutes if you had anything else to offer. Uh, no, I appreciate that answer. And as I said, I'm not complaining about this particular one. It's just a kind of cautionary tale as more shelters necessarily get built, we should look wider than just the core of the city. So thank you. Perfect, thank you. And Mr. Barr can jump in as well. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Planning Services has talked at length about uh, appropriate locations for these with our housing providers as well as housing services, and we understand that there is uh, both 
uh, place considerations as well as access to service considerations. So being on appropriate transit in areas where it's very accessible as well as being near the support services that the youth need are both important considerations. The way the city's zoning was previously structured is that a crisis care shelter, which is what this is called under the old zoning bylaws as well, was really only allowed as of right in the downtown area zones. It wasn't really contemplated in other parts of the city and that's also uh, a result of our official plan. So when we're looking at updating our policy, this is a section that we will spend time on to understand and see what is being implemented in other cities, best practices, in order to bring forward a really more comprehensive housing strategy when it comes to shelter and sheltering services. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Other committee members looking for comment or questions at this time? Councillor Osanik. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, through you. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, um, Ms. D uh, Didrickson, for mentioning about uh, and putting in the report about the exterior lighting. So, um, uh, like, I don't want this to have to be bumped up to site plan. Um, I'm just happy that it's mentioned in the report that, you know, exterior lighting will definitely be looked at um, um, as part of the site plan process. So that's really good. Um, since we do have the members of um, the Kingston Youth Shelter Board here on this line, I just wondered, um, can I ask the question, is this Kingston Youth Shelter um, replacing an existing one, or is this in addition to the existing one? That's my question, thank you. Not a problem, I'm not sure who will respond to that. Ms. Brown. Brown, I believe you're here, or Mr. Oh, and Brown, yes. Apologies, yes. we have a jumping around Zoom screen, so. You have the floor. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to respond to that. Yes, it will be replacing the current um, location that we have split between uh, Brock Street and Berry Street. Thank you very much. I could have emailed that, but since everyone was on the line, that was just like my question. Uh, that's really good. And um, uh, and Mr. Chair, since you're saying we can also provide comment for a quick second, is that correct? That's fine, yeah, you have five minutes at this point and then technically again when it goes on the floor. Okay, I'll just say the one comment. Uh, Councillor Neal, I am sorry to disagree with you. For affordable housing, yeah, definitely that can be spread right across the city, but when it comes to the youth shelters, you have to like put yourself in the case of these poor kids that are then on the street from nine in the morning until 8 p.m. at night. They need access to food at lunch and food at dinner. And Martha Table is downtown that provides lunch and Lion Hearts is in multiple locations downtown for dinner. If they were in the West End, you know, there's no food for them. And it makes a really long day from eight in the morning or nine in the morning until 8 p.m. in the elements in minus 30 degree weather. At least this way, there's opportunity opportunities for them throughout the day um, to um, uh, to eat and to warm up. So that's just my two cents, putting myself in the eye of the clients. And it's beautiful to think of the people we're serving, definitely, but let's just keep it to planning only because that can quickly devolve. But thank you, Councillor Osanik. I'll look for others at this point. And Councillor Neal, I do see you. We can come back to you around two in a moment, but to give our colleagues an opportunity, seeing Councillor Hutchison. I just want to ask um, Mr. Barr a question regarding his comments. <clears throat> of course, as Councilor Neal pointed out, for a long time we've been trying to devolve affordable housing and housing and shelter uh, services throughout, throughout the city. But what I understood from what Mr. Barr said, and I may have misheard this, so I'm just correcting myself, if nothing else. Um, we know those services are allowed in the downtown area, um, not always appearing in all parts of the downtown, to put it mildly. But um, I thought you said, you seem to imply that that was not contemplated in other parts of the amalgamated city. And so I know we have a policy that says we're going to spread affordable housing throughout the city. And I took it to mean that meant 
youth shelters and the like as well. For instance, Don House is nowhere near the downtown now. So how are those two elements reflected in policy? Thank you, and through you, Chair. Uh, it, it's a good question, Councillor Hutchison, so, so thank you for asking it. The, the, the real aim of the city through the work that staff are doing on affordable housing is, uh, is, uh, is to look at the entire spectrum. So when we're talking typically about affordable housing, we're talking about uh, you know, things through housing services, which could be CMHC subsidized, 80% you know, market rent, um, uh, what's the other one, RGI, rent geared to income. Uh, it's there, typically the area that we talk most about, and that takes the form of you know, standard types of housing that we see through uh, development, so apartments, condos, townhouses, ground-oriented units. Uh, but our official plan on, on part of the housing spectrum treats uh, items like crisis care shelters, uh, shelters in general, in a, in a different category and permits them as of right in different places. So they're predominantly permitted as of right in the downtown area and on the Williamsville Main Street area, uh, but provides consideration on how to evaluate it in other designations, which is the exercise that we've done today for the Kingston U Shelter to permit it here on this corner uh, at Nelson and Concession. Uh, so it's just a, it's a product of our official plan. In some cases where it says this is allowed as of right, in other ways it says it can be considered other places, but it has to meet these specific criteria. And that's the work that we've done in evaluating this location to permit this shelter here, is that it has met the locational criteria for this community facility. Just a follow up. Um, I think that's, I appreciate that. And the, um, and I wasn't questioning that in any sense. I, I don't think you inferred it was. The, um, the thing is, in some part, I think this development at Nelson Concession and the, the uh, youth services at, uh, on Princess Street in Williamsville do show devolvement. So in some sense, the city is delivering there. And also the Brock Napier Affordable Housing Project which Councillor Neal knows all about. And um, so I think what we're talking about is going further west, like we're on Ridley Drive there for a bit. That can, in fact, we're still going to be there, but in a different form, right? For children, women and women and children. So is it, it seems arguable that the city is doing this, but are we in a policy position to allow more of that and outside of the old city? That's the question. Thanks, and through you, Chair. Yes, given the criteria in the official plan, it can be considered in other parts of the city as well, given the evaluation criteria that's within the official plan. So if one was to be considered in the East End or West End or in Lakeside uh, Ward, there would be criteria that it could meet. But if we think broadly about what we've done with the new zoning bylaw as well, is we've increased permissions for uh, specific emergency style housing or group housing as well, which is allowed more broadly throughout the city. So we are starting to expand our housing continuum and how we treat different levels of affordable housing. But what we really have to do is get at the official plan through the next update to really help us consider the broader housing spectrum in a more wholesome manner. I wish I had a crystal ball and could go back in time to understand how our policy has evolved, but we are working with what we have now and uh, there's no hard restriction to consider uh, a, this exact type of crisis care shelter in other parts of the city. We would just have to look at it and say, is this the appropriate location for it given the policy that we have in place and the zoning that regulates it? Okay, so it's possible, uh, but not firmly outlined. That's what I get out of that. And um, so, okay, and then we're going to be working on making that more um, formal, so to speak. Okay, you nodded yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So we'll move into round two then, Councillor Neal. You had your hand up earlier. Would you like to speak now? We will bear with you. Unable to unmute. We'll see if we can do something on our end here for you.
Thank you very much. I'm not used to using my phone for meetings, and which I've been forced to do. Um, just, I just want to make it really, really clear. Uh, Councillor Osanic mentioned that, implied anyway, that I was opposed to this. Uh, and I said right from the start, I'm supporting this proposal. I support it totally. I will vote for it. What I was saying was that in future, we should look to diversify uh, where we put our shelters. And that was the only point I was making. I will again mention that I'm in support of this proposal and I will be voting for it. Very good. All righty. Councillor Sanic, I will indulge you, but please keep it on a short leash. <laughs> I support this too. And Councillor Neal, I was talking future tense as well. <laughs> totally. Like I support this, but for future tense to put something out in the West End without any way of these clients also getting a free lunch and a free dinner, that's where um <laughs> anyway, I was talking future tense. All right. There's peace and harmony on this final planning committee meeting of the term. Anything from the horseshoe? Again, no. Deputy Mayor Chappelle. Councillor Hill, could you take the chair for a moment? I take the chair and I recognize you. And I'll just echo the support here and um, say that I think a lot of the considerations that were brought up by the public have been well addressed and that is reflected in the report as well. So if any members of the public do hear this and can't participate now but can go back and check that out, uh, I hope they do. So I'll vote in favor. I return the chair. Thank you. So I'll look for it to be put on the floor. This is item B. Sorry, members of the public, thank you for the reminder. Councillor Hill, did you want to speak as well? Do we have anyone here on, on Zoom, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, I do note that we still do have five members of the public with us. So I'm just going to ask them now, should anyone wish to speak to the current application on the floor, if you could please raise your hand in Zoom so that we may call on you. And I do see that we have Brandon and Tazo, and there are actually two individuals logged in under the same name. So I'm going to ask the first to unmute and identify themselves if they could please. Hi, this is Paula Brooks at 387 Nelson Street. Um, Brandon was nice enough to send me a link. Um, I have a, a little bit of um, a question and I apologize. My ears are blocked, so if it's already been covered, it's just my bad. My ears are blocked, so my hearing's a little bit muffled. Um, with this zoning being passed, is it sort of um, like we're talking about the school? I know it's two separate things, but it was site-specific zoning. So if at some point in time the building was no longer designated as a youth shelter, then that the zoning would go back to what it previously was, so, sort of like how the school was, just as a safety gap, because um, with with some things that have gone on in the neighborhood and building, zoning would be changed and somebody else bought the property and things like that. So just as a safety net, just to make sure, I, I'm just curious on that, please and thank you. Ms. Didrickson, you can respond. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I can explain the site-specific zoning. Um, thank you for the question. Um, the site-specific zoning that um, that will be applied introduces um, a special needs facility use as an additional permitted use, but the same uses permitted in the rest of the neighborhood would continue to apply. So if, um, for whatever reason, Kingston Youth Shelter didn't require the building anymore, um, the building could be used for any of the uses currently permitted in the rest of the neighborhood, which include um, low density forms of housing. Um, there are some community facilities that are permitted like a community center or, a, or even a school. Um, those are permitted in, in the zone that applies to the houses to the north of Concession Street. I hope that helps. Thank you, and I actually broke our own rules here. Usually we compile the questions and then have the planner respond, but. That was my prompt and my bad. So um, if the member of the public did have other questions, what we'll do is hear from you. And then after a few members of the public, the planner or staff can respond on, on some. So, okay. 
The next member of the public then, please give your name and address, and I'll repeat myself. We'll collect those questions and then the planner will respond. And I won't ask them to respond mid midstream. Just right here, I'm just asking a question. Hello, Brendan Tozo, 53 Kings Court. Hi all. Uh, so question is about, uh, there was a mention that the technical review was delayed or wasn't completed. Uh, what would the technical review reveal, a uh, technical review reveal uh, once it's completed and why it hasn't been completed yet? So I'm curious about that, thank you. And I'll look to the clerk quickly. Is that the last member of the public that we have with the hand raised? All right, so we will actually go back to the planner now, but because that concludes our public portion. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair, um, and, and thank you for the question. I can clarify the technical review of the zoning amendment has been completed and staff have brought forward a recommendation on the zoning amendment application. It's the site plan control application that addresses matters of detailed design like fencing and uh, exterior lighting, um, pedestrian uh, functionality of, of access to the site, um, line painting on the parking area, those matters are are still going through a, a detailed uh, technical review through the site plan control application um, where staff has delegated um, authority unless it's brought back to the committee. Um, so that technical review is, is ongoing um, and the site plan control approval application can't be granted until the zoning amendment, up, uh, amendment is in place. Thank you very much. And I should note, it's good to see another councilor elect participating in the planning committee perhaps warming up to take these chairs in a, in a week's time. So that was Councillor Lactozo. Um, now we can have committee move it on the floor. So we'll look for a mover, Councillor Hill, seconder, Councillor Osanic. There's an opportunity now for any final comment or question to staff. Seeing none, all in favor? And that passes unanimously, thank you. Our final file tonight is for um, Woodhaven Drive and Princess Street. So that's 950 to 956 Woodhaven and 3028 Princess Street. Mr. Peggy, I believe you are online. And I can see you now, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. and. Uh... I wish you a happy uh, last planning committee. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm presenting a recommendation for approval uh, for a zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision at 950 to 956 uh, Woodhaven Drive and 3028 Princess Street. A public meeting was held on May 4th, uh, 2022. As part of this presentation, I will summarize the updates to the plan since the public meeting and responses to some of the matters raised through public correspondence uh, and at the public meeting. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the application is to redevelop the site with a medium density uh, residential development of 35 three-story townhouses with common elements to be held through a condominium. The effect of the application is to uh, rezone the property to the urban residential type 3B zone with an exception overlay to capture site-specific provisions and to approve a draft plan of subdivision uh, to divide the site into seven blocks for townhouses and two blocks for common elements subject to conditions. Uh, future applications for final plan of subdivision and final plan of condominium will be required. Next slide. The site is located in the Cataraki uh, Westbrook area along uh, Woodhaven Drive between Princess Street to the south and the Cataraki West neighborhood to the north. The site is approximately 0 0.9 hectares and is currently developed with four semi-detached residential units. 
The site is located within the urban boundary and municipal water and uh, sewer services are available to the site. Uh, at this time, there are no Kingston Transit stops near to the site, although uh, Kingston Transit does have plans for a nearby route in, in the future. Uh, the nearby frontage along Princess Street currently does not contain sidewalks, uh, but both sides of Woodhaven Drive uh, does currently have sidewalks. The stormwater pond area to the north also provides some opportunities for pedestrian connectivity and open space access. The tree inventory submitted with the application confirms there are 53 trees on site, all of which will need to be removed for the proposed development. The applicant uh, has proposed some preliminary landscaping and will be required to include a landscaping plan uh, in the final plan of subdivision application, uh, which will provide further details on replacement plantings. Next slide, please. The proposed zoning amendment would permit uh, development of 35 uh, three-story townhouse dwellings. Uh, through a plan of subdivision, the townhouses are to be divided onto seven blocks with the intent to further divide the townhouses onto individual lots. The development also contains a private roadway, a stormwater management area, communal amenity area, and visitor parking area, which will all be held through the uh, common elements condominium. The condominium framework will provide the townhouse owners with access to the common elements, as well as share the responsibility to maintain and upkeep those elements. The proposal contains a range of unit options, including two and three bedroom uh, units. Uh, 10 of the townhouse uh, units will be back-to-back -back units uh, and do not have rear yards. And the remaining 25 townhouses will have rear yards with private decks. Next slide, please. Uh, six pieces of written correspondence have been received, and two members of the public provided oral submissions at the public meeting. A uh, full summary in response to the correspondence uh, is included in the comprehensive report, and original submissions are included as an exhibit and in the addendum to this evening's agenda. Based on the correspondence and the discussions at planning uh, at public meeting, the following areas of interest were identified. Uh, the first being zone selection and relief requested from the uh, Kingston zoning bylaw, various aspects relating to parking, the design and function of the private roadway, uh, potential adverse impacts of noise, and the proposed stormwater management of the site. Next slide, please. The first area of interest is that around the passing of the Kingston zoning bylaw, uh, questions were raised around why the urban residential 3.B zone was selected and why the city would permit uh, relief from the newly passed zoning bylaw. Uh, so the URB, uh, UR 3.B zone was selected as it best reflects the proposal submitted by the applicant. Uh, the zone permits for a range of ground-oriented residential dwellings uh, and is commonly used in similar subdivisions in the city of Kingston. As for relief from the Kingston zoning bylaw, the development was first proposed under uh, the former zoning bylaw 7626, uh, which was repealed and replaced by the current uh, zoning bylaw. The Kingston zoning bylaw may be amended subject to council approval uh, for any uses and developments which are consistent with the official plan and the provincial policy statement. Next slide, please. Uh, the second area of interest would be about, uh, around parking. Uh, there was concern expressed that there would be no accessible parking spaces included in the visitor parking area at the northeast end of the site. Uh, so it is expected that all accessible parking needs will be accommodated on the individual driveways for the townhouse units. Uh, this is consistent with the um, 
uh, zoning bylaw, which would not require uh, accessible parking spaces for freehold uh, townhouse units where parking spaces are accessed directly on a driveway. Uh, although this development is for a common elements townhouses, the units function uh, similarly to freehold townhouses. Uh, and then with regards to uh, electric vehicle spaces, which was also discussed during the public meeting, uh, staff have worked with the applicant to confirm that uh, each garage will be uh, equipped for an electric vehicle and that two of the visitor parking spaces uh, will have electric vehicle charging units. Uh, and that's been reflected in the recommended zoning bylaw for the site. Uh, lastly, a concern uh, was raised during the public meeting uh, that some of the driveways would be too short for larger trucks and vehicles. Uh, staff and the applicant have uh, collaborated on a note in the agreement of purchase and sale, uh, which will inform potential buyers of the shorter driveway lengths. Uh, the note uh, is a condition of draft plan of subdivision. Uh, and it should also be noted that uh, the 5.2 meter length is the minimum. Um, and at, uh, at this point, the conceptual site plan depicts only 14 of the 35 driveways to be less than six meters long. Next slide, please. Uh, the form and function of the private road was another area of interest raised through the public correspondence and at the public meeting. Uh, one question was around uh, maintenance and snow removal. Uh, the maintenance of the private road will be the collective responsibility of the owners through the condominium uh, corporation. Uh, and the applicant will be required to provide additional details on snow removal and storage for the final plan of subdivision application. Uh, another question is related to emergency access. Uh, the application was circulated to fire and rescue staff for their review, uh, and they confirmed that the site will have sufficient access for emergency personnel on site. Uh, and then related to the design of the road, uh, concern was raised that there is no boulevarding between the private roadway and the internal sidewalk. Um, the lack of a sidewalk buffer is not expected to be a safety concern given that cars are not uh, expected to travel at significant speeds throughout the site. Uh, the site, uh, the roadway will not generate any through traffic uh, and will only service uh, the site itself, uh, including uh, residents and visitors. Uh, the roadway is only six meters wide, um, which just allows for uh, a vehicle traveling in either direction. Uh, and those thinner travel lanes uh, generally encourages uh, slower traffic speeds. Uh, and staff can also take a look at further traffic calming measures uh, through the final plan of subdivision application if necessary. Uh, next slide, please. Another area of interest uh, would be related to noise. Uh, the noise impact feasibility study uh, submitted with the application recommended that development uh, includes a 1.8 meter high uh, acoustic barrier fence uh, to reduce noise from Princess Street. Uh, concern was raised during the public meeting that the fence may compound noise impacts to the property uh, to the south, um, kind of uh, causing a, a bit of a reflection. Uh, the noise consultant who conducted the original noise study used the same formula to predict the sound levels at the neighbor's dwelling. Uh, the findings indicate that there's no discernible difference in sound levels, whether or not the acoustic fence is put in place. In the worst case scenario where the acoustic fence is 100% reflective, uh, the, sound the sound levels in the uh, neighbor's side yard are calculated to be the same and the sound level would only increase by one decibel in the rear yard, uh, which is considered uh, negligible. So the findings there in, uh, indicate that the addition of the acoustic fence would not adversely impact the neighboring property due to sound reflection. Uh, next slide. 
So lastly, the city has received uh, comments relating to the stormwater management of the site. Uh, the comments have been reviewed by uh, stormwater review staff uh, who uh, they confirmed actually that they uh, already intended to clarify several of the same points through the technical review of the final plan of subdivision application. Uh, at the current uh, draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment stage, uh, technical elements such as stormwater management are reviewed to determine whether the development is feasible and whether the technical element uh, will require any specific zoning provisions or conditions of draft plan. Uh, an example in this application would be the rerouting of the Highgate Creek uh, tributary, where the applicant worked with the CRCA and city staff to determine appropriate setbacks from the water course uh, to be included in the zoning bylaw. Uh, the city's stormwater review team can confirm that appropriate stormwater management is feasible uh, for the development to, to move forward, and that further details uh, will be examined through the final plan of subdivision application. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, the proposed development meets the locational criteria for siting a new medium density development. It will contribute to the city's housing supply and it represents infill on underutilized land within the urban area. The development is anticipated to be compatible with the uh, existing neighborhood and will not cause any uh, adverse impacts to neighboring land uses. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment is consistent with the provincial policy statement uh, and conforms to the city of Kingston official plan. Planning services therefore recommend approval of the zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision for 950 to 956 Woodhaven Drive and 3028 Princess Street. Next slide. Uh, if the zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan are approved, uh, future applications for final plan of subdivision and final plan of con uh, condominium will be required. And uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. So committee members, do we have further clarification or comment? Oh, Councillor Osanic. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, I have several questions for staff about this. Um, I don't know where to start. Let's see. Um, okay, for the 53 um, trees that are being removed, does, okay, the owner of this property, is it where he also owns 3028 Princess Street, or what's the um, the block, like the in the report somewhere, I don't have two screens right now, what block does, does the report say that the owner also owns? Is it 3028 Princess? I believe we're just confirming that, Councillor. Oh, Mr. Peggy, go for it. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, it, it is uh, um, 3028 and uh, uh, 950, 956 Woodhaven. Um, so the lower uh, block of 3028 has been severed and is not part of the okay. development application, but the, the northern, let's say, two thirds of 3028 are part of this development proposal. Okay. But thank the, you. yeah. Okay, and then so the uh, 53 trees being removed do not include the trees at 3028 then, is that correct? Uh, I believe that is correct, yes. Okay, but then... As in, uh, sorry, if I may just clarify for a second. Uh, it does not include the small portion, the bottom third of 3028. Okay. Um... All right, because 3028 has a lot of trees too. So I just wondered if all those ones are part of the 53 that are being cut down. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, um, that is correct. So it is part of the 53 trees being cut down? 
Yes, uh, the the portion of the property of 3028 uh, uh, that forms part of this development, uh, which is the top two thirds, uh, those would, the 53 trees um, are encapsulated in that, uh, in that area. Hmm. And um, I think I just heard you say that the creek, like the the creek is being diverted to that area, like the two thirds of 3028 Princess Street, is that right? Hey, this is all confusing. Please, yeah, Mr. Peggy. Okay, yeah, uh, through Mr. Chair, yes. Yeah, so the, um, uh, there is a small tributary to the Highgate Creek, uh, which as part of this uh, development uh, is being um, uh, shifted uh, to kind of circumnavigate around the uh, development lands. Hmm. And so like we couldn't save any of the trees in, in that area? Like, I just cannot believe that all 53 trees need to be cut down. I, I, I just can't get over that. And so that's why I'm trying to picture, like, if there's no hose going in the, uh, the area, um, <laughs> like why we're saying, go ahead and cut down all these trees. Member of staff? Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll look for a response. Mr. Barr. Thanks, and through you, Chair. Just building off what Mr. Peggy has outlined so far, uh, yes, there are trees to be removed from uh, this site as well as 3028 Princess Street. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is establish the basis of land use that is before us. And if we look at the site plan for this development, there is a real comprehensive redevelopment of this property that also includes the relocation of that uh, High Great Creek tributary, and that's been done in conservation or in consultation with the CRCA to look at that appropriate rerouting. But the extent of development on this site is rather comprehensive. So, looking at opportunities to save existing trees on this site uh, with the current development proposal that's in front of us isn't feasible. So, the applicant through this application will have to look at two key elements. Uh, when looking at the tree removal, they'll have to examine where they can place trees on the redeveloped property, and that'll be done in detail through the final plan of subdivision stage. Uh, and then in addition to that, trees, if there aren't enough located on site, will have to be compensated through cash in lieu of trees being planted on the site. Uh, but that detailed landscape plan is something that will come forward at the time of final plan of subdivision. Uh, so just given the, the amount of redevelopment that's happening on the site, which staff have examined and looked at and, and found to be appropriate uh, given the location of the site and the intensity of use that was proposed, unfortunately, we aren't able to uh, find locations on site in order to maintain those trees if we're looking at uh, the, the proposal and what's before us today. Okay. And through you, Mr. Chair, and we don't know how many trees are going to be proposed. Like I, I heard one person say that um, they think that there's going to be 18 trees that will be recommended to be planted. Um, you know, uh, is that true? Like we, we have no idea how many trees will be recommended to be planted. Is, is that right? Through you, Chair, yes, that's correct. We don't know the exact details at this time. A lot of that's gonna to have to be taken into consideration at the detailed design stage because we'll have to look at locating those trees in appropriate sections with the infrastructure that's proposed for the development as well, both underground and at grade. Uh, currently on the concept plan, which is Exhibit J in the report, there are 18 trees noted. Uh, however, there might be opportunity to actually plant more on site and what forestry staff and planning staff have been doing when reviewing these applications is trying to maximize where possible the ability to plant trees on site, which could include additional plantings along Woodhaven Drive itself because there will be a sufficient boulevard there, but we do again have to take into consideration both at grade and underground utilities. Uh, but it is the aim of staff where feasible to plant as many trees as possible on site in order to make up that deficiency. We went through this as well with, if you remember, I think it's 1752 Bath Road that was the 10-story building that was approved at planning committee or two ago where the comments from forestry came in 
uh, and at the detailed design stage, they're gonna be looking for them to plant a one-to-one -one replacement for the trees that they're removing from the site because there is that opportunity there. Uh, Councilor Osanic, that is the one where they had those uh, like kind of unique and different trees in the front of the property, but both forestry and planning staff are looking to maximize landscaping and tree planting and redeveloped properties. Okay, good. So uh, just uh, about that, um, I hope we do uh, get like at least 35 trees replanted since there's going to be 35 units, even better if we do 53. And if you look at the Martin apartments where the Kmart Plaza was, they've been able to plant trees between the apartment and the small boulevard where the entrance is to, the, you know, the doorway of both apartments. Very small. I'm sure there's infrastructure under there because it's right next to those apartments, trees there, Loyal Oarsman parking lot. They got a very small median in the parking lot of nothing but asphalt and concrete and this really nice tree growing in the center there. So, you know, things are possible and look what we were proposing for the tannery lands, right? Even with that, um, uh, the protective casing, you know, and just a few inches, two feet of fill they had proposed all those trees, you know, for um, the four apartments going at the tannery lands, you know, so that was possible as well. So I'm hoping we could get 35 trees, even 53 trees on this site when we get to, to that detailed design phase. Moving on from trees now through you, Mr. Chair. I'll give you about one more minute, Councilor Sanic, and then sure. come back to you for round two. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about putting a fence at, um, as a requirement of this development, which would be Princess and Woodhaven, uh, since they're going to be cutting down all the trees in that block. Um, I guess that would be block 10, I think it is, right? And um, if we can put um, a fence there so that people aren't cutting through um, uh, 3038 Princess Street, cutting cutting through there. That was written in the comments and I don't see what page that answer is. Thank you. Who would like to take that? Yeah, Mr. Peggy, please do. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Chair, yes, um, Councillor Stanek, uh, that's a very good point, and again, something that we can absolutely take a look at through uh, the detailed uh, um, design of the site, through the draft plan of, uh, of uh, or excuse me, through the final plan of subdivision. Um, uh, fencing wouldn't necessarily be uh, an aspect that uh, we would capture through zoning, but it's um, absolutely something that we can look through um, uh, at that final plan of uh, subdivision. Okay, thank you. And then for my last uh, 20 seconds, and this could go on for the <coughs> second term too, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the um, geotechnical report. Um, when do we get that? Mr. Peggy. So the geotechnical report uh, would again be uh, something that um, uh, submitted along with the uh, draft, or excuse me again, uh, the final plan of uh, subdivision and um, Perhaps in this, uh, for this, I can also pass it off to uh, the applicants who I believe are in uh, council chamber, uh, Yuko or, or uh, Kelsey. Ms. Jones, welcome to Council Chambers. I think we've only seen you on Zoom before. Yes, I think you're right. This is the first time. Feels good to finally be in one of the chairs. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, that would be something ultimately that would be completed and provided through the building permit process. Um, if the engineer did feel through the final plan of subdivision process that they needed more detail to prepare their um, 
technical engineering submission for final, um, that would be something that could also be provided uh, at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sanic, I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, I don't have time. Thank you. So just to follow up to that, so that's the applicant's engineer who decides if there's a geotechnical report that's required or is it something that the city can require? Mr. Peggy, would you like to respond? Or perhaps Mr. Barr. Thanks and through you, uh, through you, Chair. Through the detailed design stage, if there is concern about the geotechnical stability of the site, one could be requested in fulfillment of complete application. However, that is really a building permit consideration for uh, most sites uh, in order to determine the appropriate uh, building permit responses. That's where the consultant would examine the type of foundation and works that would go into the buildings in order for uh, them to be stabilized on site. So there is opportunity in the future for it, but it hasn't been flagged as a requirement as I am aware right now through technical review. Thank you. All right, other councillors? Councillor Hutchison. I want to follow up uh, <clears throat> on Councillor Sanic's uh, last question. In fact, the last couple of things she said. Um, and that is, I was expecting a response to this letter that we received a couple of days ago, which involves the lack of a geotechnical report and the inability of this person. It's very coherent and cogent letter about the technicalities involved with this site. And um, so much so I'm really concerned that we need to look at whether this uh, stormwater management is feasible. And so this is more than what was just mentioned about uh, this is, involves the storm management, uh, management re, um, plan. And I thought that was a requirement for every development. And so the question is, why doesn't it exist? Why is there no geotechnical report in relationship to the stormwater water management plan? I mean, to me, it's fundamental. Even in developments where you think, well, there's not gonna be a problem there. This fellow wrote in and he has put some very serious questions here about this, and I'm wondering if we need to pass uh, an amendment requiring that this be done, because he's saying that the um, there's a number of points here, but one of the main ones is that, uh, let's see if I can just find, that we don't know the groundwater level, the groundwater level, and that it's above the stormwater um, the, um, the, the mechanism put in place to take care of the, the um, excess water and therefore that area is just going to fill up and that the pipe is not set relatively the, the exhaust the, the, pipe, the, the pipes um, allowing for drainage are too high or too low, depending on how you want to look at it, at each end. So they're not going to drain properly. I mean, I don't know how much more serious that has to get. And it drains into a ditch, which is shared partly by the municipality, a municipal ditch. So that seems to me very clearly a stormwater management problem, which I don't think the city should just let go by. So where are we at here? And why haven't we asked for this plan? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's something, but I'm looking for the answers, okay. All right, we'll try to get a few of those answers for you, Mr. Bart. Thanks, I'm actually gonna turn this over to Mr. Petchy, who has his hand raised, and I'll give uh, him the first go at this. Thank you. Uh, and 
Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the applicant has submitted a stormwater um, management plan uh, that has been reviewed um, and revised. Uh, they've they've submitted a second revised one that uh, was also reviews uh, reviewed by uh, the city's uh, stormwater management team. Uh, the stormwater management team at the city, uh, I, I sat down with them today uh, again to take a look at uh, the public comments that were submitted and uh, they have confirmed again that they are satisfied um, uh, that the stormwater management plan is, is feasible uh, for the zoning um, and draft plan of subdivision for the site. Um, and again, that uh, those more technical details would be um, handled through uh, the final plan of subdivision uh, stage. But at this point in time, uh, they have not identified any, um, they have not identified that the uh, stormwater management plan has not made the rezoning of the site feasible and have not um, required any zone specific provisions related to stormwater management um, uh, at this time. So I'll, I, I can pass it off to uh, uh, Mr. Barr for uh, anything he'd like to add. Through you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Peggy. Mr. Peggy is correct. So we, we are here tonight to discuss a zoning bylaw amendment application to establish the basis of land use and enter into a draft plan of subdivision in order to bring this forward. So the work that has been done to date has determined that the proposed works on site are feasible, but they're not completely designed because that is not the detailed design stage that we're at yet. That's what final plan of subdivision is for. So the works that have been reviewed by the city and the conservation authority have determined that yes, we can support the rezoning of this site for the intended use and that we can move forward to the next stage through draft, through final plan of subdivision in order to work out that level of detailed design, which would actually implement everything associated that is needed to support the site, which includes the final design of all the stormwater management works. Uh, as Mr. Peggy pointed out, it has been reviewed by city stormwater staff who are comfortable moving this forward uh, to the next stage in order to enter into those detailed design discussions through final plan of subdivision. So both the conservation authority and city stormwater are satisfied with the works presented to date on stormwater. Uh, the problem with that reply, Mr. Barr, is no, no personal offense, is it's all based on faith, okay? The person has serious questions. The pipes are not at the depth that they're normally required by our own city policies. They are at least six inches, but I think more, um, above where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be at four feet or 1.2 meters and they're not. Now, I was in charge of development that had that done, and you have to blast it out to get it down. Otherwise, you're asking for trouble. And um, now, there may be counter arguments, but I don't see them here. I don't know how I can vote for this. So, I, th I mean, this is like fundamental stuff. It may be come up in the final plan of subdivision, but it should be clear before we say, yeah, we're fine. And so I'm wondering if we can, um, um, ask for, like there's no justification given by stormwater management team. Now, maybe it's not required, so it didn't come, but it's not in the report. I didn't see it. You can point to it if you want. 30 seconds. So what? So my question is, um, I, th I think we need to require, have some kind of requirement that goes with this. So if you can come back to me later. Yeah, we can I'll do round two. And amendments are in order, but Mr. Barr would like to respond. Sure. Thanks, and through you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Hutchison, uh, 
and I guess I guess the the same kind of thinking back. This isn't really based on good faith. This is based on technical principles and planning. Uh, this development can't proceed past final plan of subdivision through to a building permit unless the technical details are resolved. So the approval tonight is just one step in the process, and they still have to go forward through final plan of subdivision. And if they do not satisfy the city's requirements for final plan of subdivision, then they can't proceed. They wouldn't get that final planning approval and they wouldn't be able to move forward to uh, you know, a building permit stage. So all city technical requirements, including engineering, uh, you know, zoning conformance in accordance with planning, any permitting from the conservation authority, that all still has to be dealt with. Uh, and that's what we do through the final plan of subdivision stage because after they get their preliminary approval to say, you know, yes, we do feel confident that the basis of land use here, so the, the townhouses and back-to-back -back townhouses and all the zoning provisions that go along with that are good, that allows them to proceed with confidence into spending the additional uh, time, energy, and resources and money, essentially, to do that level of detailed design work. So uh, the approval tonight is, is not based on, on faith, it's based on confidence and sound engineering and planning principles that they, those technical details still have to be fulfilled and they cannot proceed to a building permit until such time that all of them are complete because they wouldn't be able to subdivide the land and they wouldn't be able to get approval for it. Okay, so the final thing is, how do we ensure that the concerns raised by this correspondent are answered? Like, I know all concerns are not equal, right? And some of them are answered right in the report or at the meeting, but this is not. Mm -hmm. And so that's my concern. And it, I agree, I understand your argument, this planning argument, but without the report, but without the engineering in place, none of this is quite possibly not gonna work. And I'll hold you there just because you're over five minutes, sure. but a response is warranted. Uh, yeah, thank you, and through you, Councillor Hutchins, I can see us both smiling at each other as we're having this conversation. So uh, I will say that, you know, the basis and grounding of everything in planning is, is also sound engineering, uh, and that's why we have the conditions of draft plan approval, which are found within the report as Exhibit B. And specifically under number 11, required studies, the required for, for final approval is a satisfactory stormwater management report, designs, and everything associated with that. So that's actually built right into the draft plan of subdivision conditions, where if those conditions are not satisfied, the development cannot proceed. All right, thank you. So, Mr. Park. Yes, uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to follow up on that to uh, Councillor Hutchison by saying the reviews done are done by professional stamped engineers. They are not going to sign off on anything that is not supportable because they're, they're licensed to make sure they do make approvals based on sound engineering. So it isn't just planning, it is we've got the hard facts behind us with the engineers. Point is it hasn't been done yet, so we don't know. We can come back to this if we need to, but I'll just pause to make sure no one else wants to go. Seeing no other counselors. Oh, I'm sorry. My computer's blocking you. Deputy Mayor, after you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Councillor Fowley, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hearing non-responsive answers. Uh, I'm hearing that this comes out of the final plan subdivision. Well, at that time, you know, the, the, the city councillors are no longer engaged. It's up to the city. Um, floodplain issues and water issues and drainage issues, I would say consume a lot of my time when I was on council, especially in, in that district. And, and, and I'm not comfortable not having answers to this gentleman's letter that went forward that demonstrates to me that he is quite knowledgeable with regards to the, the storm water management plan. So I'm very disappointed that it looks like we're trying to just shuffle it along, move it along. In fact, with, without substantive responses, I'm not sure I can support this with going forward today. But I will leave that for another round two. I'd like to know, it, it, uh, the question I have is, can we put a hold on this until that plan comes forward, that technical uh, report comes forward, or do we defer this until we get that technical report? Those are the two questions I have, and then I'll have supplemental if I have time. 
All right, I might look right to the manager or director on process and the overall flow that this information comes out um, in response to Deputy Mayor Chappelle. Uh, thank you, and, and through you, Chair. Uh, Councillor, I, I hear your questions, and uh, what the planning staff have put forward is the, the typical process for uh, this type of application where uh, we're working towards those details. Uh, the feasibility's all been done and satisfied as part of this application through the professional works done by their stormwater team and the review of the city's stormwater staff. Uh, we didn't put a hold on the zone because the draft plan of subdivision conditions contain the specific criteria that have to be met in order to bring this application forward to final plan of subdivision. Uh, and all of those technical details will have to be satisfied at that time. It's not a level of detail that we engage in in any sort of plan of subdivision application when we're at draft plan stage. Uh, final plan of subdivision can also be uh, bumped up to council for additional review. So that is still an option for this application as it moves forward. And that will be brought forward uh, when the final plan of subdivision is ready to come up for that review should that application be submitted in the future. Uh, a hold could be placed on the zone um, in addition to that, but it's my opinion that the draft plan of subdivision conditions adequately contain that level of conditioning where that report still has to be brought forward and then can be you know, brought to further light in review at a council meeting should it be bumped up at that time. Uh, a deferral, I don't know what would achieve tonight because we're at a point where feasibility has been determined and that is a level of detailed design that an applicant would engage in and spend the time, money and resources on once they're through to draft plan condition approval and working to satisfy those conditions of draft plan. Okay. Uh, th thank you. How much time do I have, uh, uh, Mr. Oh, Chair? A generous four minutes. Okay. Um, well, I I'm still not comfortable, uh, Mr. Barr. I, I appreciate your your, your comment. I, I think what I, I think I'm disappointed with, along with my colleagues, is that it seems that this correspondence with um, this this resident has been going on for well over six months, and the responses this resident has received are either non-existent or unsatisfactory. So it it, pause, it gives me pause to support this 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 particular proposal. Another issue, you know, we just had a resounding rebound of kids going out trick-or-treating this last Halloween. And there's chaos in the streets. You know, it's pandemonium. They're all knocking on doors. And the notion of having a subdivision with sidewalks on one side of the street, not on the other, gives me great concern because when I hear comments about the streets are narrow and the cars are not expected to travel fast and that we can put other lane reducing speed mechanisms in place, tell that to a parent whose child gets hit by a car and dies. I, I'm telling you, we need to have sidewalks. If we want to have pedestrian friendly communities, we need sidewalks everywhere not just on one side. And so I asked the staff, if we are to, to, to be building communities that are responsive to families' needs and public safety, why would we consider a subdivision without sidewalks on both sides of the street? All right, I'll pause your time there and look for a staff response. Mr. Burt. Thanks, and, and through you, Chair, the city I guess I'll talk broadly then narrowly about the application. So with our draft plan, sorry, with our uh, plan of subdivision design guidelines, uh, those specify sidewalk on one side of the street through most areas, unless it's a collector or arterial or through street. That's where you typically see sidewalks on both sides of the streets. If you think about this subdivision specifically, Woodhaven Drive has uh, sidewalks on both sides of the street, but the internal streets do not. Uh, there is a balance of things that have to be achieved through a subdivision when we're looking at uh, the many different aspects we're trying to implement. So sidewalks also take away sometimes from the ability for uh, the location of infrastructure to go in certain aspects of the street or tree planting. So we have to examine the subdivisions on balance when we're trying to balance both roadway, pedestrian, 
and uh, other types of infrastructure that have to go into a subdivision. When we're looking at this application specifically, sidewalks are provided on one side of the street, but it is a, a short site. Uh, sidewalks are provided, yes, curbside facing, uh, but curbside facing sidewalks exist in other parts of the city, specifically in the downtown and other residential areas where uh, you know traffic is at a lower speed or there is more street parking. Um, through the review of the application, staff did determine uh, that the sidewalks here uh, are well and positioned for the development, uh, oftentimes uh, within, uh, or sorry, providing that appropriate front yard parking space for each of them, uh, but providing that connectivity out to Woodhaven Drive, uh, which is the primary north-south uh, walkway here. And speaking with transportation services, they're also examining sidewalks on Princess Street along the entire north side here in order to connect Woodhaven Drive through to Bay Ridge Drive. So pedestrian connectivity is a big consideration uh, when we're looking at these applications. Uh, and for every reason that Mr. Peggy has mentioned previously through his presentation, the, the curb-facing sidewalks here uh, were deemed appropriate and satisfactory for the pedestrian movements of the site. Okay. Um, as, as a parent and, you know, eventually a future grandparent, I, I still think sidewalks are important. So I'm not completely happy with that. Uh, uh, I look at some, some, the fact that anyways, I won't belabor that point anymore. I appreciate your response. Uh, the, yeah, the water course that's being redirected. Um, I don't think the setback is sufficient according to our plans uh, that we have set out in our plans. It, it seems to be it's, uh, the setback is way too close and it's not supporting what the Cataraqui Regional Conservation Authority would have agreed upon. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, is there any, is this something that's going to be addressed in, in the next site plan or is it something that's fait complete right now and that we've reduced the setbacks from this water course? Thank, thanks and through you, uh, Chair. The Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority has been involved in this application since the beginning and we're the ones to make the recommendations for the 6 meter and 3.5 meter uh, setback to that course. Uh, in looking at the application's stormwater management report, this small tributary drains a very small portion of land. Uh, and once the site is redeveloped, it predominantly only drains the rear yards of the townhomes on the eastern side of the site. So anticipated flows are minor compared to other tributaries that we see, uh, which is why the Conservation Authority was comfortable making the recommendation for six meter for the rear yard and 3.5 for that one southern in, uh, lot line for the setbacks to that um, uh, feature. Mr. Peggy, do you have anything additional to add to that? Um, yeah, uh, through Mr. Chair, just that um, um, at this time we are uh, establishing uh, zoning provisions and that 3.5 meter setback is, is one of the provisions that um, is being established and the applicant will need to um, uh, eventually when, um, you know, if, if this is going through the process, they will need to satisfy that three and a half meter uh, setback. At the moment, the conceptual drawings are still quite conceptual. Uh, so um, we will need to, to examine that uh, uh, three and a half meter setback um, once the actual uh, uh, creek is, is rerouted uh, and the uh, final design of the buildings are put forward to, to city staff. So the applicant is aware of that three and a half meter setback uh, at that south yard uh, and they will need to, uh, uh, to comply with that. Okay, and uh, if I have time permits uh, through Mr. Chair, I have a question about um, air conditioning units on the back-to-back -back townhomes. Will the units be placed on the roof or are they gonna be put on someone's front yard? How does that work? I, I really can't envision that. Mr. Peggy, do you have a response? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that, uh... The 
location of the air conditioning units has not been um, uh, proposed at this time, but uh, perhaps I can um, uh, throw that to the uh, applicant team. Or perhaps Mr. Bart. Hi, it's me again. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, the air conditioning units for this building have not fully been uh, conceptualized as to where they will sit on a property, but there are multiple ways that uh, air conditioning units can be contemplated for buildings like this. It could even be contemplated in, in a style similar to a condo building where it's an interior or wall-mounted unit that would have a small feature on the outside of the building. Uh, so it could either be located in the rear yard, it could be located on the roof, or it could be you know, a side mount kind of feature uh, that would be located on the property. Thank you. Deputy uh, Mayor, you have about 90 seconds. Uh, the back to back townhouse only has like a front yard. It doesn't have a rear yard and it wouldn't have a side mount either. So are you suggesting this would be internal air conditioners with an exit through perhaps the front of the building? Like wall mounts from the internal wall mounts? Thanks, and through you, Chair. Yeah, that could potentially be an option or it could be located on the roof of the structures because each one would have its own independent roof. And then I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll wait for round two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other movement. Councillor Hill, could you take the chair for a moment? I take the chair and recognize you. Good, thank you. I just want to make a comment, and it is actually somewhat as chair too, that I think maybe I'm allowing everyone to stray a bit because while the inquiries are really important for the quality of life of the residents, a lot of this has to do with site plan, and a lot of it has to do with additional study that will be baked in into the process further down the road. So maybe that's something for us to keep in mind. And I wonder if staff wanted to comment um, further on what comes next in terms of at a high level how some of these concerns can be addressed and if that's typical process, right? Like we're not looking at something that's unique here in order to approve the zoning, but rather some of the concerns raised, which again are, are legitimate and good. Um, come down the road. Is that fair? Thanks, and through you, Chair, I, I think that's a completely fair question. So uh, again, we're talking about zoning tonight, which is looking at establishing provisions and land use, so the townhouses and back-to-back -back townhouses, and then approving the path forward, which is through the draft plan of subdivision uh, conditions. There are two applications left required for this if it was to move forward, uh, and that would be the final plan of subdivision and then final plan of condominium. Uh, and I was just reminded as well that a final plan of condominium automatically has to come back through planning committee and council because that is not a delegated features so that specific work would also come back through public review uh, during that time those levels of uh, detailed design things like the stormwater report uh, the noise impact study done at a detailed design stage because right now it's been done for the feasibility aspect of it but when we move into that detailed design stage uh, all of the specifics about where all of those roof mounted or side mounted or uh, wherever our conditioning units might be located, uh, would be completely studied through that detailed design in, in the noise stage, uh, as well as any sort of additional requirements for uh, things like transportation or other stationary noise sources offsite and their impact on the development. So again, this is, the, this is one stage in the multi-step process in order to bring this development to fruition. Thank you, and my final question to staff would be, if they could explain the ways in which this type of infill, missing middle development meets other policy objectives for the city, does this conform with the way that we look to do density, particularly in curbing urban sprawl? Thanks, and through you, Chair. Short answer, yes. Long answer, uh, this is a type of development that we haven't typically seen uh, for infill development. It is townhouses and back-to-back -back townhouses done in a condominiumized style format in more of a ground-oriented traditional look and feel. So it's not as though the units have underground parking and the, the, the townhouse units are stacked on top. There is a private roadway here. Uh, there are sidewalks. There are units that appear to just be in ground-oriented style format, but the infrastructure is not municipal. There is a new type of housing unit here, which we're starting to see more of, which is back-to-back -back townhouses, which offer a variety in the built form in the city of Kingston uh, that we are not 
uh, fully building out at this time, but are seeing more and more proposals for. And what that will help to do is add to the mix of housing available in the city, in including a range of affordability and options for uh, the citizens of Kingston. This development would be medium density and has satisfied all criteria of the medium density residential land use. Uh, and it has the appropriate amount of amenities based on site. So in terms of intensifying underutilized sites in the city where there are a couple of units here now on the site, it would be increasing uh, quite significantly to uh, 35 units on the site. I believe that was the last count I heard. I might be making that up, but I just confirmed, yep, that is correct. Uh, so it is also trying to satisfy uh, the city's long-term goals to intensify within our urban boundary to increase our urban net residential density to be transit supportive and financially sound. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I'll take the chair back. I return to the chair. All right. So, Councillor Hill, I'll recognize you. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really frustrated by the conversation. It's not the first time we've had this conversation, but we're here to talk about land use planning. Is this a suitable project for this piece of land? Uh, does this make sense? We're not here to sort out every detail that will come at the next level. If we want to do that, we can do bump up. You know, There are options for us to continue to review this if we want to as a council. We certainly, I think we should have by now, faith in staff that they're going to do the job of, of overseeing these projects and ensuring that they meet the standards that, uh, that are required. It seems to me that every time somebody writes a letter who purports to be an expert, we go running wildly uh, off into the night, pulling at our hair because somehow they must be right and all of our staff must be wrong. I just think that's a terrible, terrible way to proceed. I want to make that noted. I hope this you know, doesn't continue to be a part of this. This is about land use planning. It is not about site development. If you want it to be about site development, bump it up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hill. So we do have an opportunity for a second round of questions, but I would remind committee we also can contribute when we put the motion on the floor and we haven't yet heard from members of the public on this. So with committee's blessing, I'll say that we move to public and then come back and you can have as long as you want um, when we get to committee question again. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone joining for the file? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, we do have two members of the public still with us and at least one hand raised. So with that, we'll turn it over to Harold LaRue. Hi, can you hear me? We can indeed. And just please remind us of your address and the floor is yours for five minutes. Okay, uh, my address is 948 Kenshaw Street. I own the property immediately south. I'm the uh, purported expert that wrote these uh, uh, this correspondence, and I never claim to be an expert. I'm just asking questions, and the questions haven't been answered. The whole problem and why all these questions are being asked is the development is too intense for the lot, and that's why there's no room for trees, there's no room for a buffer between the sidewalk and the road, which I think is just plain wrong, and on one street there's no sidewalk whatsoever. So the, the knee bone is connected to the thigh bone. Everything's connected together, and it has to do with the development that's proposed. It is too intense. And I would suggest that you uh, look at these back-to-back -to -back townhouses, where they've been built in the past, to ensure there aren't problems with them, because they are very suspicious. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, there is another hand. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, next to speak is Paul Shaves. Hello again, how are you? Hello, the floor is yours. Again, again 14 St. 5 Sierra Avenue. Um, I have mixed feelings about this proposal. Would like to see it go forward. Just have some questions, concerns, which I have received and have myself. Uh, I did not notice a traffic study regarding this proposal. Also, due to the increased density of this already busy intersection, will there be one, a reduction in the speed limit to 50 kilometers on Britain Street, as has been recently done on Colin Bay Road, Midland Ave, and John Counter, where residents front onto the above mentioned roadways? Two, will there be a proper right hand turning lane to be installed at this intersection? 
the tree preservation report states there will be 35 units, but only 18 trees planted. What happened to the city's plan for one tree per unit? Uh, this is also a very dense project, as already been mentioned, in a very small area. And for what I can see, no amenities will be included for the future residents, namely regards to parks. This subdivision is severely lacking in regards to parks, only having a very small parkette on Jeanette and a small park off Rosanna. I am not taking into consideration the future community park. These residents would benefit from a park at, as a break from all the concrete, not to mention the 10 lots with their backyards. Also, it is nice that there will be a note regarding shortness of the driveways. However, how will this affect resales or those who ignore the note? This is an issue recently brought up in council regarding the east end with a request to allow vehicles to impede the sidewalk. This causes concerns to those with mobility issues, parents with strollers and young children using the sidewalk on their bikes, scooters and other. I can see for I can foresee injuries and or damages to vehicles occurring if this minimum standard are not adhered to. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Final call for members of the public. Madam Clerk, we see no one. All right, so we'll look to who to answer that. Mr. Peggy, you can start. Yes, thank you uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to uh, Mr. LaRue and Mr. Chase for their, uh, for their comments. Um, with the regards to the intensity of the development, um, staff feel that they can recommend approval of this application based on the medium density um, locational criteria within the official plan. Uh, among other official plan uh, criteria for new development uh, within the city. Um, um, excuse me one moment here. Um, um, the the site is uh, quite appropriate for this uh, form of development being within the urban boundary and having access to uh, um, to water and sewer and, and city services. Um, uh, it is intensifying a uh, underutilized um, piece of land, um, which is generally uh, supported by the uh, official plan um, in staff's estimation, uh, no adverse impacts uh, will uh, um, will occur to any adjacent land uses as a as a result of this uh, development. Uh, with regards to a transferred impact statement, uh, yes, a study was submitted with the first. Uh, submission uh, uh, with the application. Um, uh, I'm unsure of any uh, plans for a right-hand turn lane uh, along Princess there, but the uh, basis of the uh, traffic impact study, similar to these other technical uh, studies, is to uh, um, to, to ensure that uh, the zoning of the site is feasible um, and that the trips generated to and from the site uh, will not negatively uh, impact the surrounding streetscape. Um, that was reviewed by transportation staff and, and uh, deemed to be uh, acceptable. Um, uh, with regards to amenity and uh, uh, parks and, and backyard space. Um, the site does uh, does provide that 200 square meter uh, parkette, which uh, does fulfill the amenity requirements for those back-to-back -to -back townhouses. Um, 
each of the uh, townhouse units does also have access to a backyard and a back deck. Um, uh, residents, uh, private owners will have the opportunity to plant trees in, in, uh, on their lots and the uh, applicant has um, uh, suggested some, some tree plantings uh, through the final plan of subdivision. Um, it's it's uh, evident that council and, and staff as well are supportive of additional plantings uh, on the site. So we will definitely uh, be looking for additional details uh, on those plantings. Um, and uh, with regards to the shortness of the driveways, um, um, I, I, I can note that, uh, um, again, it, it is a conceptual site plan at the moment, but the majority of driveways do exceed six meters in length. Um, and um, um, if I'm not speaking out of turn, at, at some point a buyer um, um, is, is responsible to, uh, to ensure that their needs are, are met um, when, uh, when looking to purchase a home. So um, we'll have that, uh, that note uh, for all future purchasers uh, of the site. And uh, I believe those are required to be passed on, um, passed just when these are, are initially selling. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, there is, there is that responsibility and as well, there is the, uh, um, uh, bylaw services and, and property standards, uh, um, uh, would ensure that, uh, that those, uh, trucks might not be spilling onto, uh, onto sidewalks, um. So hopefully I, I got through some of the public comments there. I'm, I'm happy to pass things off to uh, Mr. Barr, or Mr. Park, or either of the applicants for their, uh, for their comments as well. Thank you there. We have uh, Ms. Jones, the proponents team, who can further explicate what she needs to do. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to add um, to Mr. Pedry's responses, um, in terms of the TIS that's been completed, um, I do want to confirm um, that the traffic engineer um, did review um, and assess the potential traffic that would be generated by the site and determined it to be modest um, and has confirmed through their review that the um, existing capacity of the surrounding roadways, so that would be Woodhaven and Princess Street, um, are currently capable and will continue to be um, capable in the future uh, up into 2027 uh, to support the um, modest traffic generated by the development. So no um, right-hand turn lane was deemed necessary um, to support the development. And as well, just in terms of the uh, comments regarding the trees and sidewalks, um, I just want to note um, that this development will be subject to uh, the city's uh, council approved subdivision guidelines. So that requires at least one tree to be planted uh, for every three townhouses. Um, through the final design process though, we will be looking to maximize the number of trees planted. Um, Mr. Barr noted uh, previously that the um, boulevard along Woodhaven, right now there's no trees shown to be planted along that boulevard, but the intention would be uh, for trees to be planted along there and then kind of subject to the final grading plan for the property, maximizing trees at that point. Um, and then as well, the subdivision guidelines do require only one sidewalk, um, a sidewalk on one side of the street. Um, so just wanted to provide that extra clarification. Thank you very much. All right, so committee, we pass new, I'm sorry, I'm missing Mr. Barr. After you. That's okay, just a brief question. So we, I did hear a comment that the, 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 there was a sentiment that the application or the development was too dense and that the back-to-back -to -back townhomes were suspicious. Planning staff do not agree with this position. We do find the density to be appropriate for the site and the built form to be appropriate as well. Back-to-back -back townhomes provide another uh, piece into our housing continuum uh, and they are appropriate in our position. 
All right, thank you. So that would conclude the public portion, and I wanted to mention to committee that we had passed new guidelines for our operations here, and at two hours, we are able to take a bio break if needed. Seeing no one moving, I think we can finish up then without that tonight. Oh, Councillor Chappelle, Deputy Mayor Chappelle, you need to go. Okay, so let's take a five-minute break, and we'll recess until, uh, let's make it six minutes. That'll be 8.15. Thank you.
All righty, it is 8.16 and we have quorum, so we will move back to our planning committee here tonight and we're looking at uh, the final file on the agenda on Woodhaven and Princess. Councillors, I suggest we put the motion on the floor and then again, there's lots of time for debate, discussion, questions, if we do that, so I'll look for a mover and seconder. Councillor Hill, Councillor Osanic, okay, thank you. Who would like to speak to the file? Councillor Osanic. Thank you, um, I still have questions through you, Mr. Chair. That's fine. Um, so I just want to ensure that that it's true that this is a unique new layout that we haven't seen before and that we don't, we, the city doesn't have back-to-back -back townhouses anywhere else like this layout or do we have um, something like this somewhere else and if so, where? Mr. Barr. Thanks and through you, Chair. I have not seen back-to-back -back townhouses anywhere in the city. So the townhouses in the middle of the development I believe or something new. We're seeing more proposals for it, including on the opposite side of Princess Street on the south side in, in your district, Councillor. I believe we had a public meeting for that in the summer. Uh, we have had developments come forward like this that are condo townhouse style developments uh, without back-to-back -back townhouses. That being specifically like Newmarket Lane and Conacher Drive are other examples where we've had condoized townhouse developments. And Mr. Park, you'd like to piggyback? Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, just adding on to what uh, Mr. Barr said, uh, Councillor Osanek, within the city of Kingston, no, we've not seen back-to-back uh, -back townhouses, at least James and I are not aware of any that we're, we've seen come through. However, we, you, you do see similar type back-to-back uh, -back proposals. Uh, I've seen them in Toronto and Ottawa, so it is a common built form. It's not an experiment per se. So they are successful elsewhere. It's just they've never been brought forward before in Kingston. Thank you. Thank you. And um, where else should I go with this? If like we put the faith of um, what we were uh, recommended to do before break, right? Having faith that this will all work out fine. If the stormwater management does not work out fine and there is flooding into 3038 um, Princess Street, what's the recourse for the person who owns 3038 Princess Street? The legal recourse. Thanks, and through you, Chair. Uh, I'll start this question and then hand it off to Mr. Park. Uh, the stormwater management facilities at 950 Woodhaven Drive are going to be private stormwater management facilities. They are not to be owned and operated by the City of Kingston. Uh, they are to be reviewed through final plan of subdivision to meet all technical specifications. Uh, and then afterwards will be operated by the condo board itself. So if there is an issue between uh, the uh, private property owners, it would be a matter between private property owners uh, here. Mr. Park, do you have anything additional to add? Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair, adding to it, Mr. Barr's comments, uh, your question about liability, Councillor, I think if you can recall, there was a report that did come back to planning committee recently, it was with the Highway 15 quarry, and a similar type question was asked about liability, and uh, city solicitor uh, Ms. Morley explained that the engineer that signs off on these plans and says it is uh, supportable and doable is the one that ultimately becomes liable for it because they've put their professional stamp to it. Hmm. Yeah. So the poor homeowner of 3038 has to undergo civil litigation then. And uh, uh, it's such a risk. It's such a risk to approve this. Like with the stormwater questions that we had been asking that, you know, including Councillor Hutchison um, earlier in the meeting, like we were told that, you know, it's just, um, it's just high level. It's just the feasibility aspect. 
but if it is so such high level, like where all of our confidence as counselors, uh, you know, goes down um, in approving this is because for what they did provide at that high level is then, you know, like one professional engineer versus another where another professional engineer, like the resident tonight who wrote to us, he's a professional engineer. I'm not a professional engineer. And he's doubting like some of those like uh, calculations that were used. And, and so I'm not a professional engineer. I have to, you know, um, give credit to, um, you know, the, the issues that are raised um, in, in the correspondence that we received. And it just casts so much doubt. And if it is just so high level, like why would the applicant have provided us these numbers that then, you know, like look like they're in error and need to be corrected right off the bat, you know, like it just puts so much doubt in that this is gonna work out right to the adjacent landowners. Um, I just wish that the high level, you know, calculations in those reports on DASH right now, uh, you know, understanding that it's just zoning and that it's not the final draft of subdivision and the detailed design stage right now. I just wish that those reports on DASH right now were of, um, um, you know, didn't cast doubt from other professional engineers in the community that are looking at those reports. It just makes me worried. That's, that's the thing. Councillor, we have indication from Mr. Park that he could comment further and I'll stop your time there. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, I, I hear what you're saying, Councillor Sanek, and I mean, with all due respect to Mr. LaRue, who I understand is, is a, an engineer, he, he is entitled to his opinion. I'm not sure of what his, um, you know, training, you know, his, his training was obviously engineering, but was he, was he reviewing subdivisions and stormwater plans? I'm not sure. What I can tell you is that the applicant's professional engineer has to put their credentials against this. And then the city's engineer that signs off on the report is also putting their credentials against this. So they are not going to sign off on something that is high risk. They would not put the corporation in that, that position. They would not put their own professional integrity in that position. So yes, some faith has to be put in these professionals. That's what they're trained to do. That's what they're paid to do. And we have to rely on their opinion. If, if there is a third party that is saying they do not necessarily believe or they have concerns with this, if our engineering staff and the consultants engineer can address those concerns in the more detailed reports, which are forthcoming, because I stress that again, they have not been submitted yet, they are just feasibility studies, that will be proven that it is either supportable or it's not supportable. But until we see those detailed studies, a definitive answer cannot be given. But if it is not supportable, it will not get approval. That I can assure you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just like my last question, and then I think I'm going to be proposing some amendments. Is um, in the uh, letter of correspondence, I can't remember if Mr. Peggy um, uh, <laughs> um, addressed this or not, but um, it's about the ditch. And um, right now, 3028 has a sump pump, um, a sump pump pipe <laughs> that goes into the ditch. And with this development to the north of um, 3028, um, like it's going to be storage chambers, which means filling in the ditch. So um, how do we, how, how does, like what happens then to the sump pump uh, pipes from 3028 if the, like it right now is draining into a ditch but if we let this development go to the north of it the ditch gets filled in so where does the water go uh, from 3028 did we um, address that Mr. Pedgy you can have the floor and Councillor Sanic quickly I'll let you know you have 30 seconds left so if you're going to propose something, please do it within that time so we can restart your time. Okay. 
thank you, Councillor Councillor Orsanic, and uh, through Mr. Chair, a uh, specific uh, solution uh, for that uh, issue has not been um, uh, has not been discussed. Uh, that would need to uh, come through that further detailed. Um, uh, report uh, that's uh, incoming. Um, the intent would not be to block the uh, a private landowner from um, from handling their own uh, stormwater management uh, on on their private property. Um, and um, uh, the applicant's uh, a stormwater engineer would need to uh, uh, develop. Uh, uh, a way to uh, uh, to accommodate the uh, the neighboring uh, properties um, stormwater. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just an additional piece of correspondence through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I think the question was, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Osanik, what happens to the water on 3028 Princess Street, the other lands owned by applicant? Is that correct? Sorry, 3038. 3038. So um, yeah, so. Uh, yes, okay, so now I understand adjacent. the question. Yeah, no, that, that, thank you, I understand the question now. So the, the stormwater management report details how water will be dealt with on the site, and there isn't gonna be a ditch that's filled in. The existing water course on the east side of that property, uh, which is between it and the other lands owned by applicant, will remain a drainage feature to drain uh, the parcels in this area. In addition to that, stormwater management reporting ha looks at the, the site in its totality and how water moves across it. And stormwater management practices dictate that you have to deal with the water internal to your property and you can't eject it onto a neighboring property. Uh, and that will be further examined through the detailed design stage, but all stormwater on this property that lands on it will be dealt with on this property and is not anticipated to free flow over land onto adjacent properties. Okay, thank you. That gives me confidence. All right, um, I have sit, submitted an amendment um, for approval as approval as part of this overall recommendation. Okay, so we'll pause your time there. You almost were finished five minutes anyway, and we'll look to the clerk. Yep, we'll need a minute to pull that up. Councillor Sanic, do you have a seconder at this point? I believe Councillor Chappelle. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we'll get it on the board, I'll read it out and then you'll have five minutes to address your potential amendments, but we'll take a minute to pull that up, okay? So I'll read it out when it comes. All right, I can see it on my screen. Councillor Sanic, can you see it on your screen? Perfect, okay, so we have a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Deputy Mayor Chappelle, that a geotechnical report be submitted and posted on DASH that includes the determination of the level of water table and bedrock, that the detailed design stage, final plan of subdivision, ensures that the inlet pipeline to the storage chambers meet the minim minimum depth of Bury as required by the city's technical standards, that the detailed design stage, final plan of subdivision, ensures that the bottom six inches of crushed stone below the storage unit will drain fully. Oh, sorry, those are the resolve clause. Right, got it. That is within the current uh, motion, I apologize. So to be added to, exactly. Is that accurate, Councillor Osanic? Yeah, I, yes, I just want to point out that these three things be done. Okay, perfect. So I and will... Resolved and, and resolved. Thank you. I will restart the clock, and you have five minutes to make your case. Mm -hmm. These are the three items um, from the correspondence that I see could maybe still be outstanding, or I'm not an engineer, maybe they have been resolved, in which case it should be really easy then for staff to ensure that they are resolved in that uh, uh, detailed design stage, uh, final plan, the subdivision. These are the three things that will make me be able to 
approve this <laughs> development, you know, with a clear conscience. Uh, because right now, um, I'm not a professional engineer, but I think these things are the um, crux of what is still outstanding and um, uh, needs to be addressed. That's it. Okay, thank you for that. So we have the motion moved and seconded for amendment. I'll look for further comment or a question, and I'm going to look to the clerk for a moment too. Sure, okay, so um, speaking with the clerk, we'll take a five minute recess only to allow staff to see how what's proposed dovetails with what's already recommended. And that way, if any committee members have questions, they can answer them a bit more meaningfully. So we'll take five minutes now and come back at 8.36. Thank you. 
All right, so we're a minute over time. It's already 8.37. Time flies when you're having fun, question mark? And I don't see any of my other counselors here, so we'll give the folks on Zoom a moment to return. And when we hit quorum, we can recommence. All right, there we are. So, um, Councillor Osanic, we took that recess, but you do have more time, so I should recognize that. You're only at about a minute. Exactly, and you can speak at the end to make your final points as well. Sure, I'll speak at the end. Perfect, okay. So I'm looking for hands up around the horseshoe or online. Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm just, so I've got three questions for staff about the three points, basically. So I'm looking at uh, point number one, the geotechnical report. Is that, is that a land use planning issue or is that a, a final plan of subdivision issue? Thanks, and through you, Chair, uh, I have been speaking with our development engineer as well, our development technologist and planning services. A geotechnical report is not something that we ask for on private property for development applications. We really only see those for uh, municipal roadways that are being dedicated to the municipality. So this is not something that we've contemplated for uh, private development within the city. Uh, so point number one, uh, you know, isn't something that we would deal with through draft plan. It isn't currently something that we deal with through final plan of subdivision. So it's, it's, not, it's not a land use planning issue. It's not normally part of the land use planning discussion, is it? Correct, yes. It's normally not part of our consideration for this type of development where no public road is being deeded to the municipality. And the other two points that are, that are included in the amendment, they are to do with final plan of subdivision as opposed to land use planning. Is that correct? These do not deal, with, uh, sorry, through you, Chair, these do not deal with the matter of zoning related before us, but they are forming part of final plan of subdivision through the existing draft plan conditions. We have, we, and this specifically would deal with the design of the stormwater system, which is condition number 11 in the draft plan of subdivision conditions that a final stormwater management report be prepared and, and submitted with a plan to the city in order to demonstrate detailed design is satisfactory for this development. So could these issues be addressed uh, 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 as part of a bump up? Through you, Chair, they could be dealt with through part of a bump up because we do provide a report, but these items are already satisfactorily covered in the draft plan of subdivision conditions that exist as, a, as part of Exhibit B to the report this evening that is before you for approval. So I have a point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Hill. Uh, my, my, my point of order is that these have nothing to do with land use planning, that they can be dealt with in another uh, uh, forum, and that this is not an appropriate part of our discussions tonight and should be ruled out of order. Okay, I hear you, but before I make that ruling, I just want to clarify 100% with staff, because in my reading, the first two resolve clauses in the amendment deal with policy or additional reports. And I just want to be crystal clear that those details would come at a later stage should the application move forward. Through you, Chair, that's correct. The, the matters related to the stormwater management report come forward through the final plan of subdivision detailed design works. Uh, so they already are matters to be addressed as part of future applications. And finally, one more time, in other words, if it is passed as already listed without the amendment, items one and two uh, get their their shake down the road. Two and three, yes. One isn't typically addressed because we do not require a geotechnical report as part of this plan of subdivision application because no private or sorry, no public road is being being deeded to us. This is for private development. Any future stormwater management report would have to take into account its features that it's being placed within. So understanding where the water table is and the geology of the area in order for sufficient drainage or guidance of water to happen would be undertaken through the stormwater management report. Okay, so then with that answer, I would agree these are not in order at this time. So I will rule them out of order. Just for my own clarification through to the clerk, does Councillor Sanic have an opportunity to speak anyway? Mr. Chair, through you, so at this point, if you're ruling um, the, the two clauses out of order, she would still be able to speak to the first clause. Fair enough, okay. Councillor Osanek. 
Oh, okay. Uh, thanks. So I would still have my three minutes. So, okay. So if the a geotechnical report is only required for roads, then okay. And it's like, we'll just withdraw everything. I'm fine. Unless you still want to vote on it and just shoot it down. It's up to you. But I do have a question then about, um, I have one more question to staff before sure. I can. Okay. So staff, can I hear you say verbally 100% that then when we get to the detailed design stage and the final plan of subdivision, that 100% for sure as part of the city's technical standards and this subdivision, we are going to ensure that the inlet pipe to the storage chambers meet the minimum depth of Barry. Like we are gonna follow our own city of Kingston technical standards about the inlet pipe to the storage chambers meeting the minimum depth of Barry. Thanks and through you chair to you, Councillor Osanic. Uh, yes, we're going to make sure that the design of the stormwater management system is sufficient and satisfactory in order to be able to handle the flows of water that would come from the site and that would be ejected from the site through the system. It'll have to meet all technical specifications of the city. Uh, whether or not it will be exact to the guidelines that are before you through the City of Kingston stormwater management control guidelines, I'm not a stormwater management reviewer, so I can't say whether or not uh, there is lenience or guidance to those that is exercised by our stormwater management group, but it will have to meet all technical specifications to flow and work properly. Councillor Sanic, you have plenty of time, so, and my computer is shutting down. Okay, so I know that you have about four minutes left if you wish to use it. Yeah, so. It's the legal aspect. <laughs> I just don't like, I just don't, uh, I just hate having to then, I don't know, I don't know. It's the legal aspect. Um, it then makes the city just say, well, we did our best and it's homeowner versus homeowner in the future to resolve anything if something goes wrong. That's all I'll say. And just for clarification, you formally withdraw the motion to amend? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. All right, so we're back to the original motion. That's item C in your agenda. I'll look for further comment or question. Councillor Hutchison. Um, based on my talking to staff, um, it seems that an amendment, not exactly like that one, but somewhat the same, can be brought to council regarding the final plan of subdivision, which there will be something anyway. But we could require request a, a council request report um, um, on those de on the details, particularly to do with the stormwater management water management report. Is that correct? Thank Wait, you. That, that'll be like months from now, right? So, but that can happen. Yes, through you, Chair. Uh, through a council motion, the council meeting where this application would be uh, on the agenda or even subsequent to it passing a council should it get to that point, uh, council can recommend a bump up application to a final plan of subdivision, uh, which would come before council, not planning committee. And through that motion, you could specify specific areas that staff can highlight in a report associated with that application. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I would be looking for. So it's not in this context. It's been ruled out of order by the chair in any case, and no one objected. So that's done. And but it can be raised again on Thursday night, correct? Through you, Chair, yes, it can be raised again Thursday night. The inclusion of a, a bump up motion could be introduced at council four months from now uh, if wanted to bump it up, if it wasn't bumped up previously. So it can be bumped up Thursday at council uh, where this application will be on the agenda or at a future date. Okay, so um, Councillor Sanic, I'll be in touch with you, okay? <clears throat> Mm, that'll get done. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. 
and Deputy Mayor or Councillor Hill. Councillor Hill. Yeah, I, I, I recognize you. Well, I was wondering if I could recognize you. Did you have anything to say? Oh, no, sorry. No. I'm done. All right. Okay, so I will then be recognized. Sorry to you. ping pong there. But All right, I recognize you. I just wanted to say I think that it's always, as it, well, maybe I said earlier, legitimate and good to bring some of these bigger concerns up that need to be addressed, of course, but at a different time. So the zoning, in my reading, looks like it's what we want to do as a city, and then we will learn the particularities as we get to those points within the process. So I hope we can all support it. And then if it does need to be bumped up on Thursday night or at another time, that would be welcome, of course. So I will be voting in favor. Thank you. And I'll take the chair back. Perfect. Councillor Hutchison. I just want to say that I have no objections to this. Well, I have problems with, there's issues with this, um, I have no basic objections to this development. I'm fine with the townhouses. I'm fine with the back-to-back -back townhouses. I'm concerned about the width of the streets and the parking issues that may ensue. I'm thinking of Greenwood Park right now. There are certain areas of Greenwood Park which are a mess on, on a weekend or in the evening. And we've had an issue come, the local council brought it, and we went there to this proposal, rightly or wrongly, but it's like a very difficult problem. And I don't think if we know those issues are there, we should be moving. I'm not saying staff is in a position to do anything right now, but or, or when this application was made. But I think what Councillor Sanic is worried about is that sometimes we seem to be allowing things to happen that we could perhaps prevent in terms of the livability the ability of people to live in this a particular development. And of course, there's a tendency for developers to want to squeeze as much out of the parcel of land as they can. So we do, but we have to manage that tension. So also as in terms of uh, his remark about, you know, what is the land use planning and all that, well, no offense, but <laughs> the whole time I'm in council, <laughs> It's always been allowed to bring up these details, right? And they've been treated the same. And if you try to take that out of the public participation process, God help you. That's all I gotta say, okay? And, and we, and because that's sometimes what really bothers people, right? There may be seven substantial questions and one like, what the heck was that, right? So, I, I see why the ruling was by the chair and suddenly and uh, and the objection was made and I understand that. Okay? But nevertheless, in the context we usually have, that we traditionally have, and you know, traditions are important. <laughs> it's quite allowable, right? So anyway, um, I just I just thought those comments were necessary. I'm worried about the trees. I'm in agreement with Councillor Sanic about that. I believe the proponent's planner said it was one in every three. Oh, so we need to look at that again. Perhaps there should be one for every lot. That's, but the, that is often a practice. It's not uncommon. So in different places. And um, so I, I, I take it that was correct. Staff agree with that comment, right? And um, in the driveway length, of course, that's part of the street parking, right? And I'm particularly interested in the downtown council. I don't have those suburban issues, but I do have issues with cars parking out over the sidewalk, and I hear about it. And that's, I don't think we should encourage. That's, uh, I recognize the arguments for and against in this case, but something to keep in mind. Anyway, that's all I have to say. I'm, I'm going to vote for this, but uh, with those sort of hidden caveats, not, or to the side caveats. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Hill. 
Thank you. Just in response, and I agree with uh, what Councillor Hutchison said, but one of the things that I think we need to be careful about is that although that can certainly be a part of the discussion, and often has been, uh, it shouldn't be part of the amendments that go along with this. We should be focused on land use planning when we're making our recommendation back to Council. And I think that's the one cautionary note that I would, I would add to that, just because, but I don't think it should cut off necessarily the conversation. And I think people take back some important information from that conversation. But when we make recommendations to council, it's gotta be based on what our purpose as a committee is, and that's land use planning. Thanks. Thank you. And seeing no other hands, I will prompt the deputy mayor. Yes, Councillor Chappelle. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I look at the subdivisions that have already been developed in the area. I think of, you know, Holden Avenue. I think of Jeanette Street. I think of these locations that are highly intensified that um, really are not safe for children to be on the street. Uh, but at least some of them have sidewalks on two sides of the street. I look at the fact that, that um, we have parking issues. We have complaints. We have people who are really upset about all the, the congestion that they have. And this proposal to me, it uh, does not allay the concerns of future traffic problems, the future lack of trees on people sub on their lots. And um, quite frankly, I, I just think it's, it's over intense and doesn't need to be. Um, so um, I, I can't support it in good conscience uh, because there's too many questions left outstanding. And uh, certainly after hearing Councillor Hill's lecture tonight that uh, supported uh, my decision to vote no. Thank you. All right, so we will call to question and all those in favor. Opposed? Councillor Osanic and Deputy Mayor Chappelle opposed. That carries, yes, to be clear. In the opposition are Osanic and Chappelle. Alrighty, so we have no motions, no notices of motions, but as mentioned earlier, the director would like to speak under other business. Mr. Parker. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as this is the last planning committee of this council's term and this committee's, I just wanted to uh, extend planning services uh, gratitude for your service on this committee. Uh, I did a back of envelope calculation based on the agendas over the last four years and congratulations, you did 93 meetings and reviewed 259 reports. That's quite an accomplishment. Um, so um, for five of you, you're not returning. Uh, Again, wish you all the best in your next chapter. Uh, Councillor Osanic, we'll see you next round. And uh, again, thank you. Uh, this is such a key committee uh, at the city. Uh, it deals with a lot of business. We got a lot of public input. Um, the city is going through a change. We're going through growth uh, and we're getting a lot of pressures and interests across the board and it's all about balancing that so the input we receive from the committee members is valued and uh, again we appreciate your your service uh, not only to this committee but obviously to your term to the city as a councillor so thank you very much and all the best thank you mr park and i think i'd be remiss as chair if i didn't acknowledge that city staff play such a vital role in balancing the input of developers, the input of community, the questions and comments from council, and that is a very tight squeeze. So the fact that we were able to get, I believe you said 259 files before us to make decisions on is a testament to your team. So I know on myself personally and uh, my colleagues here, we'd like to thank you two for providing that opportunity and we wish you the best in continuing that type of growth agenda that we're seeing. So thank you very much for that. Um, and to our colleagues here, everyone, especially those who aren't returning, thanks for the countless hours because <clears throat> we can maybe commodify the number of meetings, but if we think about the time in emails, talking to residents, preparation with staff, and then the actual time sitting around 
mainly on the computer for this term because of COVID, uh, it would be almost innumerable. So thanks everyone for that as well. And with that, we have correspondence already noted in the adids. And the next meeting will be on December 1st, where, again, Councillor Sanic, you will likely be the only returning planning committee member if you decide to serve in that way. And we definitely hope that you do. So thanks, everyone. We'll look for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Hill, Councillor Hutchison, all those in favor? Good night.